Jackson, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and elders past and present. Tim Minster's ducky for cover. That's right. You're on the microphone, Leon. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, besides the minister, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Rhonda and the other visiting speakers. Um, so I, you know, I, I have probably a well-deserved reputation for being a little provocative. So I thought I'd start. Um, but this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm talking about the fact that the major problems we have in assessment and management of people with cognitive impairment of our health system, and it's because it's poorly designed for the chronic problems of older people. We need to reorganise, retrain, and re-emphasise our hospital services, which is the problem because they're not really designed for what the people who are coming to the front door are. And that's the problem. So we've got a system that was designed in the early part of the 20th century, and as we get up to the middle part of the 21st century, the clientele's in, entirely changed. And one of the problems is we need to work on the recognition, assessment, and management of people with dementia and delirium. So I thought I'd start with what not to do. And this is a patient that I presented at Grand Rounds about a year ago. And um, I thought it was illustrative of the fact that we don't get it right right now. So this is a patient I did see at some stage, uh, 80 years old man. Oh, I, I like interruptions if people want to violently object. And I'm, I'll get in a little while ask people to volunteer what they think, the stuff, what's wrong with this patient. He was transferred from the nursing home with a three month history of behavioural and psychological symptoms of dementia. Right? Uh, they had started for typing with no response. He was particularly bad in the late afternoon, which is one of the many reasons why if I am forced to visit nursing homes, I'll only ever go in the morning. Because if you go in the afternoon, there's always the problems. And if you, you could be there a long time, but in the morning you can always say, look at Mrs. Smith, she's perfectly well done. <laughs> She was, uh, he was wandering around the facility, banging on the windows and furniture, and threatening staff, pushed the nurse into a corner, didn't seem to be sick, seen by the psychogeriatric team, five days before admission, no information about it whatsoever. Is, is that the usual thing? Yeah. yeah, doesn't that sound right? Everyone says that we've got these beautiful electronic records and we're all sharing information. Never happens. Anyway, so, and they, there was thought to be dementia, no type in the notes, maybe Alzheimer's or mixed. Background, he had a left total knee replacement six years earlier, and post-op was delirious and seeing snakes after the, opera after the operation. The uh, hard to get these things. This is the mini mental state, and you can see that there was one. I found about three mini mental states or AMTSs or something in six years. Not really great, is it? Including three years in a nursing home. Not great. Anyway, and there we go. Mini mental state was 24 at that time. Then he had a left neck of FEMA five years ago with delirious post op, had a subdural one year earlier. He was on Parkinson's disease. He had Parkinson's disease and was on, uh, and we don't know when this started, but we know he was on a hefty dose of Stilevo, which is carbidopa, levodopa, and ectopone. And he was at the nursing home. He has type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, and osteoarthritis. These are his medications. This is standard. So he's on quetiapine, 25 milligrams QID, PRN, which is interesting. Amiodarone, aspirin, uh, this dose of Stilevo, and then in addition had added this dose of levodopa benzerazide, QID. Had been on augmented, which is an antibody for nine months, and I couldn't find out why. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't make this up. <laughs> and then, and then ribs 
Mystic meaning patch, metazepine, metformin, and a little bit of clonazepam, why not? <laughs> so, of course he was transferred and the initial examination occurred in the ED at 21.45. Is that the best time in the world to assess somebody with three month history of behavioural and psychological symptoms of dementia? Is that the best time, do you really think? Anyway, and he was aggressive but settled down, no mental state recorded, went to the acute medical unit, acute care unit, at just after midnight. Nobody had actually commented upon any neurological examination. They did make a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, aggression, organic cause, behavioural and psychological symptoms, dementia, delirium dementia, and dehydration. So they got about every D word they could think of. <laughs> And day two, so seen by general psychiatry, increased quetiapin and lorazepam. Here's midazolam, which is severely agitated. True, okay. Day three, geriatrics, not me. History wandering on board, no obvious discontinuity. Obviously hallucinating. First time it was written in the notes. Picking at the air, talking to the persons not in the room. Alert, highly distractible. Neurological exam, increased tone, no cogwheeling, a diagnosis of behavioural psychological symptoms like the exacerbated by lever foot burn, there was a falls risk, and so this is when they stopped the Manapar 50 QID. But things still didn't go that well. Stay five, patients still, un, still listening, uh, hallucinating, unable to sit at the edge of the bed, cease quetiapine, metazepine, dazolam and leave lorazepam, and this is me, I think. And this is me, so I did this. So I stopped a few more medications, and I started Simmet. Uh, later that evening, Met called because he was aggressive and hitting, so they restarted the quetiapine. Day six, still loosening. Stop lorazepam. I mean, we got the first mental test score of the admission, AMTS 3 on 10. No real understanding of what the baseline was. Day eight, hitting out at staff, midazolam one milligram. Day nine, um, I managed to eventually get some behaviour charts filled in, and it became apparently it was worse in the evening space. It's worse in the evening, so I spaced the medications differently, and he sort of got better. So we're about to send him home on day 12. Right. Uh, GP would like special support. This is after 36 hours to try and get the GP. He just wouldn't return phone calls or whatever. So we tried to do that. Nursing home claims no geriatrician specialist visits. <laughs> Private geriatrician initially agreed, but then realised it was too far to go and there wasn't enough patients there to make it worthwhile. On day of Discharge patients spike temperature of 39 degrees and we elected not to discharge. Good decision. Um, he had an E. coli, urinary tract infection, eventually discharged back to the nursing home on day 17. So, what's the diagnosis in this? It's not hard. It's not hard to tell you. What's wrong with this man? What was he admitted with? Delirium. Good. And what was his delirium due to? Dementia. And what sort of dementia did he have? Well, he would actually probably fulfill criteria for Parkinson's disease dementia, which is a peculiar form of dementia, most of which would probably be caused by Lewy body dementia. And his delirium was due to what? The amazing medication cocktail we were giving this man. Isn't that amazing? So there you go. It's not that hard. You all knew what the answer was. Nobody else seemed to do this. So this is why I'm here. My business is on the people at the top. See, and that's the people aged 85, and that's dramatic. <coughs> this is what's happening in WA and Australia generally. It's the number of people over the age of 85 
It's dramatically increasing. In WA, the population over the age of 80 is increasing by 20% every five years. Wouldn't Chris Harvey like that business model? If you could sell furniture and you knew that the demand was going to increase 20% every five years, wouldn't you be great? See, this is my business model. It's fantastic. <laughs> And so this is to say, this is to show it to you. And you can see that the population over the age of 65 is also increasing. But the ones over the age of 80, 80 and 85 are the ones that are really going. And the, and the other thing about this is that you won't be able to wish this away. Because unless you kill the people early, they're going to be here. Because they don't move. Old people. People of this age group don't move around. We know from our studies that less than 1% of people will emigrate after the age of 65 into state. So you can't chuck them over to Victoria. <laughs> They're stuck here, right? It doesn't matter what you do, these people are going to appear. Right? So, which is good. So we have to do better. And this is uh, the AIHW. This they said that there were about 300,000 people with dementia. And dementia is a condition of older people. I know that we can say that dementia occurs in younger people as well, but that's not very many. AIHW pointed out that 1% of the people with dementia in Australia today are under the age of 60. And those people often do not have a neurodegenerative cause of dementia. When you look at the younger people with dementia, the majority are probably having drug, alco uh, drug, alcohol, and other conditions, and other psychiatric conditions, of course. So, this is the people with dementia. Okay? Three quarters of the people are over the age of about 78. Now, people say there's a tsunami of people with dementia. No. There are a bunch of people, Australians, who have, will have dementia. Possibly me. I'll be difficult because nobody will quite work out when it happened. But <laughs> the uh, people who know me are nodding their heads. <laughs> so there's a bunch of people with dementia. But on the whole, our health system is developed, able to cope with things, able to change, and we should be able to sort them out. The problem for dementia worldwide is uh, Asian and Latin America. That is where there are large countries that are becoming old before they become rich, and they have major problems with dementia. But we're not, we're not one of those countries. And this is the problem about dementia is now the leading cause of death in women. It's the second uh, commonest cause of death in anybody in Australia. And about half the people with dementia who die, die from the dementia, and about half the people die with the dementia. So, let's start talking about recognition and diagnosis. <laughs> now, this is what dementia is. And this is... So, there are a couple of... There are two major competing di uh, diagnostic systems. I prefer the World Health Organization. Some of you who love America and Americans can keep up with DSM-5, Diagnostic Statistical Manual, but I belong to the world and I'm an internationalist and therefore I do world, I do ICD-10 and 11. But for those of you who want to be Americans, fine. So this is the system. It's a syndrome due to disease of the brain. It's chronic and progressive, at least six months for a diagnosis, for a confident diagnosis. You can make a diagnosis in under six months, but you won't be confident, okay? Because you're not quite sure whether something's going to get better or you've got it right and so. stuff. It involves a decline in multiple higher cortical functions, including memory. Now, this is ICD-10. I'm going to give you a little hint about ICD-11. The bigger version of ICD-11 is out, and it hopefully will be endorsed in May of this year, and then will be out for common usage in 2022. Why do I tell you that? Because ICD-11 
doesn't actually have the requirement for you to have memory impairment to have dementia. You can have a disease of the brain and a decline in two or more cognitive functions that do, does not include memory to still have dementia. They're a bit hard to classify under the ICD-10 system at this moment, so those of you who are struggling with it. And particularly you struggle with that with people with things like frontotemporal dementia, so those of you nodding your heads. Because those people have major cognitive problems involving executive functioning and often language and other things, but technically if they don't have memory impairment, they don't have dementia. So that's going to be sorted out in the new ICD-11, which will be good. But at this stage, ICD-10 still says that you have to have memory impairment to have dementia, but memory impairment by itself is not. You should attempt to avoid false positive diagnoses, especially depression, which is what everyone has noticed. And people with dementia often have depression, particularly early on in the condition. And we know that people with depression who first develop depression after the age of 65 are more likely to develop dementia later on. So there's, uh, even though there is that association between dementia and depression, we would like to make sure that everything's not being caused by depression, particularly early on in the condition. So we would like to exclude that if possible. Now, um, the, to have dementia under any uh, criteria, you have to have a decline in either personal or occupational function. That remains a clear part of the definition. So one of the major ways you can avoid getting dementia is to get yourself a job where nobody can work out where you, you decline. <laughs> <laughs> I fortunately have such a job. <laughs> or, uh, so that's really important. That's one of my, I'll give you a few important messages about how to avoid dementia. That's your first one. Um, and finally, and which is germane to our talk today, to make a diagnosis of dementia for the first time, you shouldn't do it in the presence of clouding of consciousness or delirium. And that makes our lives very difficult because there are a lot of people who come into hospital who are clearly have cognitive impairment and have a history of some sort of memory impairment going on for months to years prior to hospitalisation, but no formal diagnosis of dementia. Who has seen such patients? Ah, and the others of you are lying. <laughs> oh, that was just to see who was telling the truth. So these are very, very common patients. And it's very difficult because you cannot make a diagnosis of dementia without actually seeing those people after the delirium has got better. Okay, very important. Now this is what Alzheimer's disease dementia, and it's largely staying the same in ICD-11, which is good news for those of you who have looked at major neurocognitive disorder due to Alzheimer's disease and the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual and been very worried by it, I am such a person, this is going to stay much the same. So firstly, Alzheimer's disease, like all the dementias, is due to disease of the brain. So Alzheimer's disease dementia is due to a specific disease of the brain and the characteristic part of it is it's got an insidious onset, slowly progressive, affecting memory first, affecting memory functioning first. And there's an absence of other features, of other conditions, particularly vascular dementia. This is vascular dementia. It's changing a little bit in the new criteria, but not very much. And it's, again, people have dementia. And there's evidence by physical examination or a stepwise deterioration or patchy cognitive deficits such that a patient has dementia and usually on imaging, on a brain scan, there's evidence of either new or old vascular lesions that are causing the problem. Seems, this seems so straightforward. It's, it's, it's so straightforward, it seems remarkable how people can stuff this up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand it. 
Okay, so now let's look at Louis by dementia. Here we are a little bit, we have a little bit of a problem because in 1992, when they released uh, ICD-10, we didn't recognise Louis body dementia. And I and other people saw lots of patients with Louis body dementia and we didn't know what we were looking at. That just goes to show. Uh, the McKeith group from Newcastle on time largely described Louis body dementia in the 1990s. So this is what ICD-11, which will come out soon enough, has decided what Louis body dementia, which our man, who I described at the beginning, probably had. Okay? So Louis body dementia is, firstly, it's the second most common form in the elderly. I put in elderly in inverted commas because ICD-10 don't know how to write things very well. ICD-11 don't know how to write things very well. I should have said older people. Okay, but we'll let them off. Um, the precise etiology is unknown, but there are Lewy bodies in the brain. Like Alzheimer's disease, the onset is insidious and slowly progressive, right? That's similar. But people with Lewy body dementia often have executive problems rather than memory problems first up. And like our patient who exhibited that, he had hallucinations, which are very, very common. And the common hallucinations are visual hallucinations, usually early in the evening, commonly little children or animals. Why little children and animals? I have no idea. But that's what, if you bother to talk to people with Louis body dementia, who usually describe these hallucinations almost exactly. They will tell you about their hallucinations, they will explain to you, they are a little embarrassed by it because people think they're going mad, so they try to, they occasionally don't like to admit to them, but they will tell you about them. You ask them if, if they know they're not real, and they say, oh yeah, I know they're not real, but I see them anyway. And do, do, do they bother you in particular? Not usually. The most important thing is, do not let people treat them because you will make the patients much worse if you give them psychotropics for this condition, which isn't going to bother anybody once you explain to the family members that they're not going mad. Right? Because that's what we see, is lots of people on quetiapine, risperidone, haloperidol, because they want to make the visual hallucinations go away. And all you will do will make these patients incredibly stiff and fall away. Because one of the characteristics of these patients is that they're very sensitive to psychotropic medication. So that's a bad, very bad thing to do. Um, so these uh, cognitive deficits are often accompanied by visual hallucinations and symptoms of REM sleep disorder. That's where they get very agitated at night, lash out, sleep or do all sorts of crazy sleep behaviour. Uh, Usually, they're much worse in the evening. They're very prone to this sundowning phenomenon. And they have the spontaneous onset of Parkinsonism afterwards. So if people get the dementia first, then they get the Parkinsonism. That's called Lewy body dementia. If you get Parkinson's disease first, and then you get dementia, that's called Parkinson's disease dementia. Why are some people who label them that way? All right. Now, as you can, as we, you may have noticed, there's a lot of people who talk about the Alzheimer's disease and dementia almost in the same breath, and they constantly want to know what the difference is, and they say that, you know, and they try to explain to everybody that dementia is the big condition, and then Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, and that, and that you know, somehow we say about 70 to 80% of people with dementia have Alzheimer's disease. Have you given that talk? Did you realise how wrong you were? So what's the commonest form of dementia? Mixed dementia. I heard a few of you say that. The commonest form of dementia is mixed. 
and the commonest pathology in that mixed dementia is Alzheimer's, right? The commonest type. So if you look at people, if you look at people in their 80s and 90s who die with dementia, which are the majority of people with dementia in Australia, right? People who die in their 80s and 90s. If you look at the brains of people who die with dementia, who are thought to have Alzheimer's disease, who are thought to have Alzheimer's disease, you do see plaques and tangles, which are the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. But you also see these things, little vascular lesions, which are very, very common. You see atrophy. You see hippocampal sclerosis in about 20% of people, which we don't understand at all, really, and cortical Lewy bodies. And we know that as you get older, Differentiating the number of plaques and tangles in people's brains, it doesn't seem to differentiate between people who are either normal or have dementia. So it becomes a less important feature as we get older. The common form, of, it seems this cumulative load of all of these things becomes more important as we get older. All right, now let's move on to delirium because it's important. And here, nothing much has changed. In fact, the DSM-5 and ICD-10 are much the same. We have these, six, these two things at the beginning, which I don't understand the difference. Somebody can maybe explain it to me. A pounded state of consciousness or impaired attention. They seem to be almost the same thing in my mind. I can't quite work out what the difference is. And then people keep on using the same words for it description of both. So, but that is an important thing. The problem in sustaining attention, the way I describe that, it's like having my medical students on a Friday afternoon. Have you ever tried to do teach anything on a Friday afternoon? <laughs> How much attention was there? Neil will think of numbers. It's really extraordinary, you know, they're thinking about, you know, what they're doing on the weekend, what their night out is tonight, you know. Barely, barely conscious in the room, really. <laughs> now, delirium is like that, but, you know, a quantum worse. It's just the inability to focus and pay attention. And there's often uh, disordered thinking, memory problems, disorientation. Hyper, hyperactivity, which unfortunately is less common, or hypoactivity, which is where people stop doing things and just lie around in bed and become the perfect patients. Nothing better than having a hypoactive person to do in your ward because they just sit around and they never call the call bell, never do anything, just quietly mumble to themselves all day. <laughs> Until something really bad happens, they fall over and break something, and try and get out of bed when they shouldn't. So, hypoactivity is the commonest one. Disturbance in sleep wake cycle, which is terrible. The onset is rapid, usually minutes to hours rather than, but can be up to days, but it's not weeks or months. You know, it's rapid. Uh, delusions and hallucinations are typical but not required. The condition fluctuates, so sometimes they seem to come good and they're doing all right for a few minutes to hours, then they get worse again. And is an objective evidence for a cause, which doesn't occur in everybody. So you can have delirium, right? <coughs> and you never find the cause. It's about 20% of people are like that. So you commonly, you know, everyone says you always find the cause, right? Well, they must be smarter than me, because I find most people delirium, they've got delirium. I never work out what the cause is. Somebody says, oh, they've got a, you know, they've got a few E. coli in their urine with no white cells, no symptoms, and that's the cause. And back then, asymptomatic bacteria is about 50 in women over the age of 80, nothing, it's not really. We never find the cause in lots of people. So, and these are the sort of causes, surgery. Surgery makes it, that's why one of the good things about hospitals, because we create the work for ourselves. So we had a bunch of people called surgeons who delighted to create the work for the rest of the hospital, which is great. Okay. Um, and there's lots of reasons why surgery does that. Um, there's drug toxicity or withdrawal. 
so you could either give drugs, like the man I showed you, give drugs to make people confused, or you can sometimes take them away. If you take benzodiazepines, which are the classic ones, if you take them away very quickly in older people, you can make them have a syndrome very similar to delirium tremens that goes on for weeks. So that's a bad thing to do. And alcohol withdrawal, obviously. Infections. Uh, the fluid and electrolyte balance, so the numbers can be wrong somewhere, including calcium and renal hepatic failure. So those are, in general, the causes. And usually they're not that hard to either look for or to find out the problem. It's just that nobody thinks to do the next step. You haven't got some, you haven't worked out whether somebody's got delirium, and therefore you can't do the next step, which is, well, why do why have I got delirium? So that's, and it's relatively straightforward, this stuff. So. Now, we used to say that delirium was fully reversible, that um, if you were delirious, you got better and you went back to where you were. Now, unfortunately, the, the real world got got in the way of that little table. So when you, you know, when you unfortunately as you get older, you've talked to a lot of people by accident or against your better wishes, but you've talked to a lot of people. And a lot of family members will say, they got delirious, they were in hospital, I didn't think there was much wrong before, but afterwards they got better after a couple of months, but they weren't back to normal and they eventually got dementia later that year. Who has heard that story? Yeah. And this is true. And there's data now to suggest that delirium isn't an inconsequential problem. Every time you get delirium, delirium increases your risk of getting dementia. So that's one of the many reasons why we should avoid getting delirium. One of many reasons. The other thing is, has anybody ever had delirium in the room? It is incredibly, incredibly frightening. People are agitated for a good reason. It's really scary. You're not sure where you're around. The people are all strangers. They're speaking this language somewhere between Mandarin and Martian. I mean, it's, it's an incredibly scary experience. And people, you know, so delirium's got a lot of reasons why we want to avoid it, but it also increases the risk of getting dementia later, later on. So it's not a good thing. And we know it's common. This is a study, a good study done in Queensland, um, showing that in this, and they did a prospective study because in Queensland, they're similar to us in that they don't know how to measure cognitive impairment in hospitals. So they're just like us. They don't do it either. But fortunately, I did this prospective study where they actually measured it, the cognitive as part of the study. And most of the people actually were undiagnosed in the study until they got done. But about 20% of people had dementia. Uh, these are people over the age of 70 admitted urgently to a hospital. Right. 20% of them had dementia, 10% had delirium on admission, and another 8% uh, had delirium during hospitalisation, developed it during hospitalisation. So they were very common. And of course, the people with delirium, are, the people with dementia are most likely to have delirium during their hospitalisation. In the group, most likely to get it. Okay. Well, I'm not going to do that. Assessment. So, these are the clinical practice guidelines. Does everybody know about these? The clinical practice guidelines. Everyone happy with these? These are the NHMRC. These are a lovely document. Anne wants you to use them because her husband was the chairman <laughs> of the committee that did And he still gets royalties. So Bob Cummings was the chair of the committee in which they wrote to anybody they could think of, including me. So these are the NHMRC guidelines for the care of people with dementia. 
They are, there's the little document and the big document. The little document's not that long. It's worth a read. It's not that long and you probably think, oh yeah, I knew that. Oh yeah, that sounds sensible. You know, it's like that. And if you violently disagree with it, yeah, well then, write to Anne and she'll pass on the line. Right? So that's what you do. If you violently disagree with anything there, it's not due to me or anybody else, it's due to Anne and Bob. Right? So just don't complain directly. So, uh, so these are, and they were published in the Medical Journal of Australia. Uh, Something was published in the SJA. Very easy to find. So this was a, um, a collaboration between the NHMRC and the Commission, and the idea and the and the funding was provided by the NHMRC Cochrane Client Partnership Centre. So this is the first step, and this we had. And the idea of these guidelines were they were supposed to be evidence-based. And so we started with this, and there is absolutely no evidence for any of this. But we thought that it was like the um, Declaration of Human Rights, there may be no evidence of it, but everyone should believe in it, right? So this is the straightforward thing. Zero tolerance of all forms of abuse. If we had that, we wouldn't have the Royal Commission, would we? Support people, say respect, you would want for yourself, treat each person as an, individ uh, as an individual, uh, people to maintain the maximum possible level of independence, choice and control, this is to support people, respect people's privacy. You know, it seems so straightforward. Why, why would you have to write this down? But, you know, we don't seem to get it right. We don't, so maybe we still help. Okay. So a lot of, a lot of work and discussion has been about do we need to make a diagnosis of dementia earlier? Now, there's a couple of things all mixed up in here. We know that people with dementia, on the whole, have symptoms for 12 to 24 months before getting assessed. And the reason why that happens are many fold. The common reason which people don't like to discuss, is that the people with dementia refuse to get assessed. They dig their heels on and refuse to get assessed. And I'm not sure we can do much about that. It's a very difficult. When people have their rights, they can exercise them. The next one, which, but some of the other things, we can do something about. The first one is that GPs will refuse to assist people after, or will discount um, the problems when uh, people are already having symptoms and family members are trying to bring patients in. We can do stuff about that. We can do things about recognition. We can allow family members to make appointments with GPs to discuss the problem separately and then to see the, the person with dementia separately. Because there are patient confidentiality issues as well here. So there may be issues about actually divulging diagnoses to family members without permission. So we can see them together. Usually, if you rush people who are being seen with uh, uh, people who are, have a diagnosis of dementia for the first time, if you just ask the person with dementia, do you mind if your family member comes in for this discussion? They usually say no because they're too quick. Yeah, it's too quick. And that's the best way of avoiding patient confidentiality issues because otherwise you can get into trouble. Um, so there are lots of issues early on about trying to increase recognition and assessment. But one of the other things that's got into here, uh, for example, instead of getting your bowel screening test, which all of you love, don't you love that? And it comes out with a little poo, poo stick to, fill, to do things with and send it off. Don't you love it? Instead of that, your mini mentor could arrive. And you could fill it in and send it back in the envelope and send it back. Uh, and then uh, if, if you score below a certain level, somebody will come and knock on your door <laughs> and walk in. And you won't have the right to refuse assessment. <laughs> so you're not. So some of you don't seem keen on that idea. 
And that would be a population screening approach, which we don't like. But we like the idea of timely diagnosis, that when people develop symptoms, they should be assessed, and we should encourage and break down the barriers to assessment, which commonly occur for lots of different reasons. Okay. So, we, we argued general population screening for dementia should not be undertaken. That's the idea of sending out the questionnaires in the mail. But concerns or symptoms should be explored when first raised and not discounted as part of ageing. And patients are working with older people should be alert to cognitive decline because this is a very common condition. This is where people get training in recognition of cognitive problems. And we also know this is an evidence-based recommendation that memory clinics are a good place for people to be seen. And now people say, oh, we don't have them available where I am and so on. Yeah, we do need to increase the availability. And the other thing that's wrong right now is because we last had a look at this service a while ago, some of the memory services are now running six, nine months, 12 months waiting times for new patients, which is totally unreasonable. It needs to be about, should be under two months. Right? Doesn't have to be next week, but it's definitely it shouldn't be more than two months. So, and it's recommendations. Now I've been doing this a long time. See this man? <laughs> This is me. <laughs> well, my young ones. And this is me opening the first memory clinic in Victoria. Look at the date. It's a long time ago. So this has been 31 years ago we worked out that maybe this would work. And it's taken 31 years away ago to implement this system badly. So I'm hoping that we'll get a bit better at it. And I still don't know what's wrong with this woman. <laughs> 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 so, so comprehensive assessment, uh, screening tests, uh, our blood tests we do, mainly to look at other problems that might be important. Uh, comorbidities, the nature of being a problem of older people means that about 80% of people with dementia, 80 to 90% of people with dementia have something else wrong with them. Usually two or three things wrong with them. And a lot of, a lot of what we do is actually looking at these comorbidities because, because the dementia itself will interfere with the assessment and management of every other condition. It's really important to get this bit. We know that the diagnostic technologies which are expensive aren't helpful. So that's things like PET scans, PIB scans, other scans, expensive scans. All those things aren't helpful at this stage, but they may be useful for research. So if your patient is in the research study, they might be useful, but otherwise, at this stage, not so useful. Uh, this is one of my own studies, just showing that the CSS you know how people were advocating the takes of CSF, uh, cerebrospinal fluid, and you know you get it out and send it off for amyloid and tau. Not useful. These are useful things. These are useful uh, tests to be done, cognitive tests, and there's a lot of them. And the most important thing is not which one, but to do one. Right? My patient, the first patient I described. No test for three years. Couldn't I get a hint of what it was like in the last three years? Wouldn't somebody, wouldn't that have been helpful for me? And the other thing that we do in assessment is behavioural and psychological symptoms, which are commonly part of assessment and are relatively common symptoms. But on the whole, most people don't have them really badly. So the commonest in behavioural and psychological symptom found in dementia is probably apathy. And apathy is where your get up and go has got up and went. 
Um, it is the commonest symptom and generally bothersome to family members. Not a terrible problem to most people. And then you go up through depression and uh, other features. But as you go up between this depression, resistive behaviour, um, aggression, less and less people have it. And so often you find that these really severe symptoms, only very small numbers of people with dementia have it. And not everybody gets it. Okay? So that's a really important thing because families are often terrified that this will happen to their family members. Not everyone gets it. And the other thing is that it's, um, it's often a transient thing. And it may go for <coughs> weeks to months, but it's not usually permanent. So, so this is what I try to explain when I go to the ward. It's like, you know, I'll be in the geriatric ward and one of my patients will be exhibiting resistive behaviour or depression to the nurse who's snarling, being quite objectionable. And I'll say, Professor Flicker, you know, this patient, what are you going to do about it? And I said, oh, don't worry about it. It's just a phase they're going through, just like your children. You know, they go, have a phase, they go through, and, and the nurse is like, oh, really? And how long will this last for? And then I'll say, oh, no longer than weeks or months. <laughs> and they'll look at me again and they'll say, and when is Dr. Kilshaw getting back? <laughs> <laughs> That brings us something to management. So, firstly, the very first thing is that we now tell people with dementia that they have dementia. We didn't used to do this 30 years ago, but I think, I don't think this is arguable anymore. Um, it just doesn't work if you don't, you don't do it. Okay. Uh, some of the other things we do are the colonist rays inhibitors. In the 90s, we had uh, some urban myths. These are myths. Colonies that raise inhibitors prevent progression of Alzheimer's disease, and if you don't treat people, people early, they're not as effective. Who's heard that one? Yeah. And who's heard colonies raise inhibitors will have a definite effect on function of delaying nursing home admission by at least six months? Who's heard that one? Yeah. So, like weapons of mass destruction, every prescriber remembers these myths, and there's no evidence. Right? It's just like looking for those weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Remember the same period in the 90s? We never found any, and you'll find no evidence of this. This is from 1999 when I wrote an editorial for the BMJ, and this is what I said, which was subsequently true. The treatments are entirely symptomatic. No substantial data support that these medications won't fight the disease. The effect of the medications overall is modest, but may be more prominent in some patients. Uh, we don't really know about how these modest increases affect patients generally. There's a modest improvement in uh, quality of life, but the change is really small on average. And delays in institutionalisation or dependency have not really been demonstrated. So that's that. The other drug that's often, that's sometimes used is Romantine. That has a specific use for people who uh, have moderately severe dementia, usually to get the drug on the PBS, it's mini mental state 10 to 14. They, in my hands, they work less than the colonosterase inhibitors, which don't work much. This, so those are the things that don't work really well. Let's talk about some of the things that work really well. Training staff works really well. So drugs don't work really well, but training staff does. Now, this is an evidence-based recommendation that based on a number of randomised control trials, that training programs in residential care settings can reduce symptoms such as agitation, reduce restraint use, and improve quality of life. So this has a much bigger effect than actually the drugs. But it's easier to prescribe the drugs. And doctors get a profit out of that, so it will keep the drugs. So you can see the problem. We have a major problem implementing evidence-based, because we don't really know how to fund it. Uh, management of symptoms. 
uh, consider our net needs, comprehensive assessment, objective measurement to monitor the type and patterns of behaviour. This is the sort of stuff that everyone says is a good idea, but maybe it's just me. So, so few times it actually happens before you actually suggest it. A non-pharmacological approach should always be used in the first instance. So, and carers can be trained in managing symptoms and communicating effectively. People, all the people with dementia like to have stuff happening in their lives, meaningful activity planning. A lot of symptoms disappear once they've got some other stuff to do. And it's hard doing this. Don't get me wrong, it's not, this is not easy for people whose lives have been constrained by their cognitive deficits. But still, this is the thing that works. Environmental redesign, uh, I think Richard uh, <laughs> Fleming has had a major role in that. And problem solving and management plan. We know that the, in general, the pharmacological management is to be avoided. We sometimes think that antidepressants might be good, but the evidence for that is by no means great. I mean, you know, maybe. We know that we should avoid antipsychotics in people with mild to moderate symptoms. And one of the major reasons why is that because they double the risk of strokes and deaths. Death is a very bad side effect, right? <laughs> and the, the, all the major tranquilizers, psychotropics, respiratory, retiopine, lantopine, haloperidol, any other one that you can think of, they all, they all increase the risk of death or stroke in a 12-week period. So, and it's probably roughly about one in a hundred. And people say, oh, you can't say that. Those people were prone to it. No, it's randomised trial evidence. Okay, randomised trial evidence. People were perfectly balanced. No, no, this, this is not a good thing. So, we don't really want to treat those people. Uh, Respiro and Lanzapine have the strongest evidence for agitation and aggression. The evidence isn't great. They may do a bit in some people. Remember the side effects. Support for carers works. Does some good things. Makes carers better. Keeps people at home longer. Does everything else. Lots and lots of trials. We don't need any more trials. <laughs> if people want to do trials, I don't know why. I mean, the evidence base is, is largely just we really haven't quite worked out how to implement this finding. And we know that there's lots and lots of, this is showing the morbidity of patients and their relatives. So, our health system is badly prepared, at least for my hospital. <laughs> Your hospital might be so much better, but my hospital is badly prepared. Yours is doing pretty well. You know, you'd never treat a patient like that, would you? Uh, timely diagnosis needs to be made more available, and, but the biomarkers and imaging are what's required. We actually need to have the assessment system working better. And an evidence-based approach to management requires much greater training in the workforce to implement evidence-based practice. Uh, I've got a few minutes of questions for people who violently disagree. Thank you. Any questions? Ah. Can you touch on a bit more about the sensitivity of diagnosis? You're talking about early diagnosis, but that's a very it's quite a sensitive issue for families. Yeah. So sensitivity meaning how well the tests perform or how well we deal with families in that yeah, exactly. uh, how well we deal with yeah. families. Yeah. It's a problem. Okay. So, um, when you have a patient with early dementia, it comes, you have a lot of information that you're putting together. Oh, sorry, I'll call it mild dementia, very mild dementia rather than dementia. But, anyway. but you, have, you have a problem that you're putting a lot of information together. And it's hard, it's not necessarily an exact science early on. Later on, 
you will have more symptoms, there'll be greater deficits, you'll be you'll be happier with the diagnosis. And people have argued that that's the place for scanning, so that people will um, you know you can have greater certainty about what's happening early on. The trouble with that is of course the scanning doesn't actually provide any greater certainty. So that's the first thing, so that's why people it's a bit of a waste of time. The next question is, why do you want to make the diagnosis that way? And a lot of the problems that you meet with, with um, making a diagnosis with very mild symptoms is that you are reliant on the objective evidence that somebody has declined in social or occupational function. Now that sounds really straightforward, it isn't particularly for those people whose lives are not that exacting anymore. They don't, they're not employed anymore, they're not necessarily doing complicated activities, they're having the occasional episode when they're leaving the gas on, they're still driving perfectly well, and the families are worried, but nobody's quite certain. And the cognitive testing is uncertain. Now, those people, if you can't make a diagnosis clearly at that stage, there's not much point in doing so. It used to be said that maybe the medications worked better at that time. No. All the evidence is that the medications work better with mean mental states of about 10 to 20, the cognitive rates and hitters we're talking about. So there's no reason why you have to make a diagnosis at that time. You can wait, and so you don't actually have to leave the patient alone. You know, you don't have to say goodbye. I never want to see you again. You can say, we're going to follow you up in six months. If something develops before six months, come back. Right? If you're worried about anything, come back. I say that all the time. Virtually nobody comes back. Right? They come back in six months, and I'm still. <coughs> Come back in 12 months, maybe a bit more. Around 18 months or two years, some of those people have got worse, and some of them have remained exactly the same as they were at the beginning. Have you lost anything on the people who have got worse? Not really. As long as you've done a good medical review and made sure that everything else has been addressed. So. Leon, there's a, um, I guess, a, there seems to be an ever growing movement towards amyloid scanning and um, yes. using that as part of the diagnostic processes, but it seems quite controversial in terms of, in terms of whether it actually yeah. is useful in the diagnostic so Yeah, so people have been uh, worried about PIP scanning or amyloid scanning or sorbetic here. Um, I'm actually, the amyloid scanning is worse than I've written. Three, three Cochrane reviews about this stuff. And I've looked at the evidence, and the evidence is this. And to put, it, to put it simply, if you look at amyloid scanning, and you look at a bunch of people over the age of 70, 20 to 30% of the people without dementia will have a positive amyloid scan. And they have a positive amyloid scan because they got amyloid pathology in their brain. But they don't have dementia. Okay. So they may get dementia, they're more likely to get dementia over the next 19 years. So here you are, 70 years old, and you've got a positive amyloid scan, and you don't have dementia. What are you going to do about it? You leave your life? No, I'd, I'd probably spend children's inheritance for the next two years. What use? You might have to be scanned, because if you have somebody with predominantly frontal deficits and you're thinking that the patient has frontotemporal dementia, but do you but you want to be certain, an amyloid scan will effectively exclude Alzheimer's disease. So that would be the only reason you should order it. But nobody ever does thinks of it that way. And that's and that would require a fairly special service. Is going through that process. Yeah. Very quickly, just to that, um, I have quite extensive family history of dementia. Um, my mother is one of five siblings for of which, including my mother, has developed dementia. Is there, um, and I know there's a familial um, connection with all of this, is there any testing that can be done to find out if this? Who 
Yeah. He's fine too. So genetic testing, it's in a little bit of, it, it, it's in a little state of flux. Yeah. At this stage, there are three, for Alzheimer's type dementia, there are three genetic mutations which are definite, which are autosomal dominant, meaning that 50% of the children get it themselves. Those are very rare. There's just a few hundred people in Australia with any of those three mutations. But we do know that people with a familial history are more likely to develop dementia. There are a few um, genetic factors genes that are just starting to appear which have not been found at this stage to be useful. The other lipoprotein E gene has been shown to increase your risk but doesn't actually mean you definitely get it. I and most groups don't think it's worth doing because again it doesn't really change what you're going to do, it just means that you might have an increased risk of dementia as opposed to not having it. Um, so, yeah, so you have to do what, what everyone does when they want to avoid dementia. Lead a good life, um, give talks because that keeps your brain active, right? You don't get much better than I do. You know, that sort of thing, that, that's good. Maybe do more physical activity than you want to, that sort of thing. Okay, my time is up. And Ellie has to speak. Yes.